Uh, let me now introduce uh, Marcus Dapp, uh, Mark Valandis, and Benjamin Degenhardt from the Chair of Computational Social Sciences at the ETH uh, Zurich. Uh, Marcus is a senior researcher um, at, the, at, at this chair and has been leading several projects related to, for example, Finance 4.0, that is going, so something I'm going to talk about today, uh, and incentivizing uh, systems that have multiple objectives in which um, the system participants do not have a single desire to maximize revenue, for example, but there are other outcomes that the people want to maximize. These are very challenging uh, problems and together with Mark and Benjamin, they have been working on this. Mark and Benjamin are also research associates at the chair uh, that is um, governed, if you allow me, by Dirk Helping, a great scholar. So, Marcus, thank you very much for joining the summer school. Uh, Please. Yeah, thanks very much, Claudio, for the nice introduction. Um, do I have to reshare um, my screen? I guess you I have to reshare, please. Yes, yes. I yes. already stopped sharing mine. Sure. Here we are. So, can you see it? Perfectly. Yes. Great. All right. So, let me organize the windows. <clears throat> So yeah, thanks again, uh, Claudio, for the kind words and of course for the invitation. It's really great to be part of a lengthy three-week summer school. I, I hope you guys are still alive and kicking. Um, I guess it can be quite exhausting to listen to a lot of lectures with, with inputs and then do work online all the time. But I hope I can um, make the following 45 minutes uh, interesting to you. So I'm going to present a bit of the work we've been doing and, and that Claudio mentioned uh, around what we call finance 4.0. Um, but also, of course, um, um, generalize and, and, and show you some of the insights we have around designing crypto economic systems, modest as our insights are and um, give you a few ideas how you could go about it, all along with, with showing parts of the Finance 4 system. Um, the second part then will be much more hands-on and concrete uh, because Ben will take over and give you a short tour of the system that is live and can be used and um, show you the token creator and how tokens can be created. And Mark will finish off with talking about a small assignment to which we invite you all cordially to participate. All right, so which problem are we trying to address with Finance 4? You all have seen these pictures, um, global challenges, um, all kinds, natural, social. And one of the root causes uh, we think is that humans are not good in judging the results over long time periods. So, in other words, the delta time between effects of our actions and our actions, if that is long, we are not very good in, in anticipating these effects. So what if you could, could compress this time somehow? Now, unfortunately, we cannot really compress time, but what we could do is to think of another strong signal that could hint to the effects in the future. And one of these signals uh, societies have been using over the centuries is actually money. So money is something um, uh, we, we, we value and use as a signal. So the starting point is money is a signal of what is valuable to us. Money is also future potential, similar to, to stored energy. If you have a lot of money, you can actually move things and people. And if you don't in these days, you, you, your actions are limited. But money is also directed energy. And today, by design, it maximizes profit. And I say only profit because if you look outside in the world and what's happening outside, maybe we should also maximize, start maximizing other things aside from profit. 
And finally, money creation is the privilege of banks, uh, in other words, of, of, of a few institutions with not so many people inside compared to the entire societies, and the question is also why. Um, Reginald McKenna was um, a finance minister in the UK approximately 100 years ago. They who control the credit of a nation direct the policy of governments and hold in the hollow of their hands the destiny of the people. Although this is not the main point of my presentation today, um, I like to invite you to think about who actually controls our money system and why it's designed the way it's designed. And could it be any different? So what we try in finance for is to democratize the whole thing. So we want to extend the concept of money as an information signal. We want to explore new monies to present different directions. And we want uh, to enable people to experiment by designing such new monies. Now, I'm not sure if I can manage to show quickly this nice two, uh, two minutes video. Let me reshare and hopefully catch the right one. Um, here we are. I hope you can. Can you see it? A green tree? We can. Perfect. Let me run it. Two minutes. We're going to listen to the sound, however. Okay, uh, you cannot hear the audio I learned. Mm. Then let me quickly switch to, to plan B. Um, I basically just give you the, the, the link and you can watch the video later. It's two minutes and it's not, it's not killing the presentation, so don't worry. Thank you. Um, let, yeah, let me go back to the presentation uh, quickly. That's too much for, for Zoom to have all these things. <laughs> okay, so you, we are back in the presentation. So sorry for that. I no, no thought maybe it's working. Absolutely. Anyway, so I was here. Um, sorry. So I was here. And, and the video essentially just, just explains you a bit more in detail what that would mean. So we create, we let people create their own monies for good purposes. So if you, if you think of good purposes, we have nice frameworks in place. One of the most popular ones, I guess, are the 17 sustainable development goals. And if you look at them, they are quite different, right? We're trying to improve societies in many different directions and ways. And all of us know or have experienced that, that money is not the money we have today and how it's designed today is not always directly supporting all these goals. Sometimes you have to bend everything quite a bit to make it work. So what if, what if we could create monies with a purpose around, for example, these 17 sustainable development goals. This is the, the thought experiment and the challenge in thinking I would like to invite you to. So having su such a system uh, requires in our eyes a few design principles that, that may not be obvious in the first place. So one is the multidimensionality of incentives, which I, which I just touched upon. Um, if you think of incentives as vectors, um, you could say instead of having one vector or one direction where every, every dot is pulled or pushed towards two, 
we have various directions and the different interests and incentives uh, you are exposed to drag you in different directions and, and hopefully lead to a more stable and resilient overall system than what we have today. That goes together with bottom-up creation of, of money or currency or actually more generalized um, um, of tokens capturing this incentive. Um, we would like to allow as many people as possible to engage in this process, to capture all the different goals that are outside and, and are relevant to different communities. Technically, it's not surprising to you, um, we, are, we use a decentralized network of peers because we think that is uh, exactly one of the scenarios and use cases of such a system. I'm not convinced of many blockchain projects in the corporate sector uh, because some of them simply don't make much sense. Um, but I think such a system that requires the cooperation of many individuals that may not trust each other and may not know each other is definitely uh, a place for a DLT system. And with a network of peers goes democratic governance. So these are the four principles we, we started with when, when initially starting to design the Finance Force system approximately two years ago. Now, I think what's important to, to understand here is, and then that's not only Finance Force, that's uh, DLT systems in general. It's not just creating a piece of software. We are not just developing a piece of software and many people use it. Like, all of a sudden everybody uses MS Teams. But this new software creates a social or erects a social technical system on top of it if it's well designed and works out and thus enables new economies to develop. So there are a hundred ways of describing what Bitcoin is and people talk about the blockchain and block sizes and every 10 minutes and blah, blah, blah. But what it's also doing, it erected a social technical system on top of the pure software, which incentivizes the participants, the users, the miners, to act in a certain way that this system gets reinforced, stabilized, and continues to work. And this new area, field of research, and also a field of practice, some call cryptoeconomics, some call token engineering. And I think it's not finally decided uh, what, what the terminology will be a few years from now. But in any case, we're dealing with complex systems. And uh, you can see in the, in the figure, there are a lot of things one can think about that go far beyond simply developing software. Breton said, if nothing else, Bitcoin has made money into a general design problem, as it should be. And not just the design of financial products or the look of paper bills, but of vessel abstractions of time, debt, work, and prestige. So if you start thinking about it, money is much more than this thing we have to buy something in a shop or buy a service of somebody. It reflects many more things and, and we should because we can, because this technology is around today, we should start rethinking the notions of value and rethink how money um, is and should be designed much more carefully than we have in the past. So talking about this design space, what are we talking about? This is from a paper, Mark Ballandis, who is also in the call, myself and Evangelos Bonaras um, have been working on for quite some time. Um, it's a way of looking at DLT systems, right? Uh, leading to a taxonomy. And here you can see the conceptual model. So we structure a DLT system in, in, in various components. I'm not going into the details of this. You can see in the, um, in the sources, uh, you can find it on archive. It's publicly available. And every component, every attribute has different characteristics 
and I counted the characteristics and calculated the combination. And it's a staggering 14 million combinations. Um, if you don't believe me, this is it, uh, in including the attributes. So if you take the outer circle and uh, multiply the different possibilities, you actually come to 14 million, even if, if it doesn't look like a lot of things. But this is your design space. Um, or this is one way of, of describing this design space when creating tokens. And I'm only talking about, um, uh, I haven't even touched multi-token systems, right? This is, this is uh, um, a, yeah, monotoken designs. So to, to make it a bit more um, maybe tangible, the red lines are Bitcoin. So this is the design path of Bitcoin. And the blue ones are Ethereum. And people may think of Bitcoin and Ethereum to be very different systems, right? The one is money or tries to be money or maybe gold or who knows what. And the other is a smart contract engine that allows for so much innovation to happen on top. Um, but in essence, if you look at, at the taxonomy, they differ only in very few, really very few design um, decisions. One is, I'm not sure if I can show you, uh, you can see my mouse, I guess. So one is um, the creation of tokens in Bitcoin and Ethereum um, is a bit different. That means um, in the case of Bitcoin, you have creation of new tokens conditioned on the fact of finding a new block. And Ethereum, it's slightly different. The other difference should be here. The supply of Bitcoin, as famously everybody knows, is 21 million Bitcoin. And supply at Ethereum, in Ethereum, currently in version Ethereum 1, is uncapped. That may change maybe in Ethereum 2. Um, we, we just don't know yet exactly. So these are the main two differences. And it's still two very different systems. Now, we did this, I mean, not visualized it, but um, we classified 50 DLT systems. And it would be interesting to have a look at, at them. And you can in the paper I mentioned to learn more about which design decisions um, can make sense and, and um, what have others done and compare this. That was the purpose of, of the paper to systematically analyze. We also found out another way of, of um, uh, let's say, while this is an analytical um, approach to, to take a specific DLT system and analyze it, going through all the questions and then you can put the path. Um, a generic or generative way of presenting it, if you, if you analyze it differently, is this one. So we identify these four questions as, be, as, as to be the, the most important questions. They make the most difference when you, when you have to decide on them uh, um, into which, let's say, bucket of overall similar systems you end up with. Is your system layered? Are you on the first or on the second layer? What is the uh, participation level? So this terminology that is quite popular but a bit imprecise, permissioned and permissionless, comes in here and you can use our taxonomy to, to explain these two and, and other um, widely used um, terms um, much more in detail and, and precise. Is staking capability present in some way? And finally, the crypto economic complexity, um, which at the moment is, is just distinguished between simple and complex. Um, but we are very much interested in, 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 in extending this work and, and um, coming up with a, with a way of describing the next layer on top of what we've done for multi-token um, systems and designs. Oh. Um, I just saw in the DL, yeah, exactly, DL stands for distributed ledger. So, sorry for that, yeah, okay, distributed ledger. The uh, overarching name of all these different things, so blockchains are distributed ledgers, 
directed acyclic graphs like in IOTA are distributed ledgers and there are other things as well. So let's go back to finance four and, and make it simple again. So instead of using money, you plant a tree, you prove it to the system that you planted a tree and you obtain a tree token. Now we can uh, have an extra session discussing what does its tree token actually mean? Is it CO2 capture capacity? Is this the wood? Is it the shadow? What is it? But that depends on, on the case and also on the definition of the community uh, who, who created the tree token. But in that, uh, in, in that vein, we do a lot of things, right? We act in positive, way, in positive ways in myriads of, of uh, contexts daily and many of them are actually not rewarded with money and economists call them um, externalities because they are outside of the actual business transaction so so the things that are actually important for us and our survival on the planet are in practice and in theory defined away as externalities which is a different problem somebody else has to solve and this is what we think uh, a big problem and this is one proposal of how to address them so for all these different things communities value they can create tokens that address and reward exactly these issues so in a bit more schematic way you have users here that do actions in the real world. It can be anything, planting a tree, riding the bike instead of the car, taking the car, helping a person in need, whatever it is. You do that, you claim to the entire system, hey, I did that, and you prove it, which is a challenge on its own, getting real life data in a trusted way onto a blockchain is a challenge. Um, ben will talk a bit uh, more about how we do that in FIN4. In any case, the system needs a proof, and the proof can involve either IoT devices or your phone or um, also other users. And the system, when all conditions are met, will reward you the number of tokens that, um, that, yeah, that you get because you did these actions. And in the cloud, all the tokens available here have been defined originally by different communities representing what they value. Now that system is, uh, as you would say, permissionless, so everybody can join, can also an join anonymously, etc. So we need, on top of all these nice, what we call positive action tokens, you need a governance layer. So on top of this positive action economy, let's, let's call it, with all the different tokens, and later in the assignment, we invite you to also design your token. Um, there's a second layer around governance. Um, and I'm not going very much into detail, but just to give you a glimpse of, of our thinking. Um, starting maybe in the middle with governance, um, imagine now that system would be live, thousands of users would be there and hundreds or even thousands of different token designs would be in the system. How would you ever know which tokens are useful, robust, well-designed, good, and which are not? It's really hard. And so we thought about uh, including a system, I will show a slide later on to that, that allows the entire community on the network to decide, decide together on the good tokens and put them in a, in a, in a, in a separate list, let's say, and um, have every, every other token in, in the general pool. It's a bit like um, the different segments of the stock exchange. You have a premium segment and then you have other segments. And to, to access the premium segment, your stock and your company has to fulfill certain uh, uh, rules and regulations around accountability, transparency, um, etc. Then another idea we are currently working on is uh, we would like to, because it's permissionless and it's a network of peers, um, these peers 
should also participate in governance, of course. At the same time, we want to prevent that, that it's too easy and too, too prone to bribery or too prone to manipulation to participate in the governance. So for that, we, we think about introducing a reputation token that ideally is not linked to your wealth on the system. Wealth in the sense of the number and uh, the number of positive action tokens you acquire. You should not have more voting power just because you have 1,000 tree tokens than somebody else who has 50 tree tokens. It should not depend on wealth. But then on what does it depend and how can we do that? Um, the third one is a liquidity token um, that's more on the economic side of things. If communities, as pre-existing communities, want to join the system, what is an incentive for them to join as, as, as a sub-community? Um, so here we think about something like a, like a reserve currency, a, a token that represents the in, the, the individual communities and their token economies. Um, I'm not going into that. Um, it's, it's a whole, its own discussion and it's quite complicated in, in the sense of the repercussions, but that's uh, also an important aspect. And finally, identity, which we are farthest away because it's really hard to do if you uh, want to introduce uh, the concept of self-sovereign identity, which means an identity that is not relying on an institution like a government issuing a passport or the equivalent of that, your driver's license or any other thing. Um, but we think if such a system will evolve and, and develop over time and grow in quantity, the, the, the graph, the social graph in there and the trust relationships could form the basis of identity. Um, but much more conceptual work is needed um, in that space. So as I mentioned in the beginning, um, we're talking about the emergence of a new research discipline. Um, Cryptoeconomic design is one uh, of the words, token engineering the other. I'm not going into all the details, I just uh, copy pasted a few definitions from some people you may have heard of. Um, and the interesting thing about this research discipline, or the promise, let's say, of the research discipline is, it enables new socioeconomic models because we can test them and try them out in vitro, actually. That means um, not just in the simulation, but also with real people because we can design comparably easy such token systems. You simply define them and expose them to a, to a, to a focus group, a test group, and they can try out all kinds of things. So we can experiment in governance, we can experiment in economics, we can experiment in organizational design, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organization is something you may have heard of. And there are even more uh, um, esoteric things like artificial life forms. Um, if you want to have a look at this plantoit.org project uh, by Primavera de Filippi, who's also very active on the research side um, um, in the legal space. But every design also manifests power relations. Who can change the governance? Who has access to governance? What are the rules to gain access? Who defines what the rules are? And these are really hard questions. Um, also because the design in the very early bootstrapping phase of a system may need to be different to one at the later stage where it's more stable and more users are there. Um, so I'm also not, not going very much into detail here, just to say um, it's a tough nut to crack as well. And finally, uh, ethical design in the triangle of um, IoT, because some of the measurements, some of the metrics, some of the data that goes onto the blockchain comes from sensors. Um, the DLT itself, and of course, um, at a later stage, artificial AI. In our case, imagine in the Finance 4 world, uh, someone in the future, all of us would have wallets um, with Finance 4 tokens, with positive action tokens, and your wallet would contain 
85 different tokens and then you meet me and I have also, let's say 110. So how do we decide how we do a transaction? Maybe it uh, makes sense to have Marcus, a personal decision. There is a question yes. by Aditya that perhaps uh, can be answered now whenever you have a minute. Sure. Let's see. How Aditya, exactly do you want to say it? How? Hmm? Hello, can you hear me? Perfect. Yes. yes. Uh, my question to Marcus was like uh, traditionally and the world uh, in which uh, we are living right now, uh, everyone wants to maximize his or her profits. Every firm has the uh, one objective of maximizing profit in the short term as well as in the long term. So like uh, the sort of uh, token based system that would reward the people uh, by the community to make good uh, deeds, like doing good actions and, you know, yep. we can have a token for every one of that. So yep. why should the people sacrifice their profitability to some extent to, in order to sort of uh, change themselves to more value based creation? You know, yep. why should they deviate yep. from that? traditional path. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the first questions uh, that always comes up. And it's not that I have the perfect answer to that, um, but think about it this way. Um, there is value in protecting a community. There's value in planting a tree, in uh, reducing waste, in taking the plastic out of the ocean. All of these things do actually, I think we would all agree, they do have value. Where the disagreements and the discussions come in is, how do we measure that value and how much is it actually? And today we only have a hammer. <laughs> we only have fiat currency, US dollars, euros, and all these things. And they all measure, because they are designed this way, they all measure the same thing. Stuff is only valuable if I can give it a number with a, with a USD or Euro tag that is larger than zero. But we would, all of us would agree that raising a child is valuable. But how do you, how do you, how do you value that in euros or dollars? Helping people escaping poverty, um, again, cleaning the oceans, things like this, all of these things have value. We all agree to that. But how do we value them? And, and maybe today's system, monetary system, have limits in, 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 in valuing these things. And there we should look closer and start to come up with new ways. So, and to the point of, of um, so the way you put it is, so I have to, actually let go, well, uh, I have to compromise. And maybe you don't, right? Um, the finance force system is not a system that would force people to participate, right? Because we cannot, it's not government sponsored, you're not obliged to do anything. We rather think of it as a parallel, a parallel system to today's fiat currency, currencies, um, that would allow people to express their preferences in a different way. And think about it. If a problem is big enough that people would start forming startups to solve it, and cleaning the ocean is a, is a great example for that. There are companies outside who, make, who, who create business models around cleaning the ocean. So why should that not be possible in a, in a finance for world where many more people address many more different problems? So if you manage to, to create a, a token economy that addresses a relevant societal problem, I'm convinced there's also a business model behind it. Just maybe our today's monetary system does not allow to express this in the best way. And so just I, I a follow up, yes. just yes, a small ahead. follow up question. Yes. Uh, do you think, in order to sort of accelerate the process for the finance 4.0 vision, uh, is it possible that a more regulated way, uh, uh, more laws and regulations can be formed? For example, uh, when we cut a tree, uh, we don't just pay the price for the resource we are getting, but also the price of the pollution, which we indirectly cause by cutting the tree. Do you think the better laws can be formed such that that penalize uh, such a pollution and that might bring a tangible value to that cutting of trees also? And it might um, accelerate. Yeah, I, I see your point. Um, 
I'm not sure, to be honest. There are laws today in Latin America and Brazil that you're not supposed to cut trees or burn the rainforest. Still, it's happening big time. Why? Because it's more profitable to burn it than to not burn it. So what I want to say with this is maybe um, economic incentives are stronger than regulation. That's not an overall truthness statement, but it may be that, that, that people act more or more efficient and more effective in their own interests than to just follow rules, especially if they go against their economic interests. Then that is the difficulty, right? So, um, I don't know if, if nothing. Point, if, sorry, if, yep. I, I don't want to interrupt you, Marcus, but I want to catch sure, up sure. on what you are saying. I don't know if the comment of what Andres said was already discussed internally. Otherwise, Andres can say it because it complements the, the previous discussion. Okay. Andres, are you there? I don't know if you can hear me well. Yes, perfectly. Uh, so I was I just added a comment because I used to so I'm still working on a sharing economy and we had the same question of why would people move to that if they can get money and get profits and we're quite surprised because in existing research and in the research we conducted we found that that actually part of the population is really motivated by other things than money. But the issue would be that another part is not motivated at all and even when they get to the sharing economy, they still remained motivated by profit. So it might be the same for the tokens. So the question would rather be how to convince the part of the population that's not motivated by those positive benefits for the community, the environment, to shift. But some good people actually exist, and we were surprised about it because they genuinely <laughs> were into that, even it was sometimes harder for them to join, just because they wanted some sense of community and feel good about the environment. Even if it costed more, was time consuming, or something like that. That was good, good news at the end of the day. Yeah. So thanks for the thanks for the contribution and the uh, yes, uh, the information. I mean, <clears throat> it's isn't it interesting that that we make this this strong distinction between people acting individually for profit and then there are some people in society that are altruistic and selfless uh, and, and they do stuff for others but of course it's only a minority and then we will, therefore we will never switch. I'm not seeing this as, as this dichotomy. I, I rather consider this, this multiple, multi, sorry, multi-dimensional incentive system as as something that expands the profit motive, if you want to say so. Maybe we can create a world where, where people aim for getting being rich in tree tokens or in waste or recycling tokens, um, just because the economy changes and it should reflect priorities of society. And at that point, it's not so much about, hey, am I being altruistic and do some token stuff or should I just go on with my normal daily business and earn real money? What real money are we talking about? Have you recently checked how many dollars and euros have been printed in the last four months? I really, I really question the discussion around fiat currency is valuable and tokens per se are not. A, a, a euro or a dollar bill is just a printed piece of money with the, backed by the government and it's ultimately its military force that you pay taxes in that fiat currency. The, the word fiat means it's by decree. It's the state says this is money by definition because I say so and therefore uh, you have to pay taxes and you have to use this money I printed so please do it. Um, so in other words, and, but, but that's leaving the presentation of today a bit, but it's an interesting thought experiment and discussion. Now imagine if we, because that's the change in mind shift, we would create money that is not defined, controlled, and, and maybe manipulated in, in, in crisis times by governments. And that's a big difference. That makes all the difference. And that's not, not touching the question 
what do people value? People have, have exchanged shells, beads, pieces of scrap metal, paper, stones, carved woods, all kinds of things has been considered money in the past uh, millennia. And not because they have been kept in the sense of limited, but they were valuable to that community at that time for some particular reasons. If, if you want to learn more about this, I recommend to read Grabber, that the first 5,000 years. It's very illuminating what can be money. Mm -hmm. And it's basically uh, in the eyes of the beholder what's money and what's valuable. Yeah. So I, I, let me leave it at that uh, so we can continue. But, but I really, I really like to, to extend this discussion much more. We have Martin, to rethink there money. Are two short, short comments. Yes. Martin, uh, raise the hand. Eric has a, a, a question. And there is a very positive comment by a ninja that I would like to say, and then you move on, and we have sure. flexibility with the time, so don't worry. Eric, can you please? Uh, would yeah, yeah, it's not really a question, it's more like a comment on top of what uh, Marcus is telling us. I mean, if you, it's quite clear uh, that, if, for instance, the Federal Reserve of the US is in a kind of panic mode. Yeah. Uh, it's clear to anyone who is watching the uh, development in terms of money printing. I mean, unfathomable amounts of uh, fiat money is being printed, not only by the feds, yeah. but also by the European Central Bank, the Japanese Central yes. Bank, and for that matter, also the, 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 uh, the Chinese Central Bank. So um, yeah. Yeah. the fiat system is, uh, is having problems. And yeah, there, there was, uh, sorry, Marcus, I don't want to interrupt you, sorry, but Martin Neely raised their hand and I would uh, uh, like that he speaks what he wanted to say. If it is short, please, Marcus. Uh, Martin, sorry. Yeah, Martin, um, yeah. my question uh, is just if we actually leave that system of fiat money and money creation by central banks, um, what's your take on monetary policy, which is currently at least very well guided by the economic situation of each nation. So if we basically don't have the ability to, to influence economic, um, the economic system by monetary policy, whatever it might be, whether it be uh, just job creation or uh, financial stability, uh, what's your take on that? Thank you. You could, <clears throat> I have to be careful not to be too political at this <laughs> research talk. Um, you can look at Bitcoin as a, basically as a software experiment, right? So somebody, we don't know who, had the idea of creating a combination of a distributed storage system and um, let's say sophisticated economic incentives. But in the first day of Bitcoin, there were no economic uh, incentives in the traditional sense because the Bitcoin was worthless, right? It took, I think, two years or three years until this famous pizza ordering thing happened where somebody said, bring me two pizzas and I give you 10,000 Bitcoin. Then you could say, okay, two pizzas, $20, 10,000 Bitcoins, how much is Bitcoin in dollars? And since then, it just developed and people get more or less crazy about where the Bitcoin uh, mm -hmm. uh, price currently is measured in some of the fiat currencies of your choice. Yeah. Uh, uh, but what it created also, how, what you could also look, how you could interpret Bitcoin also is, it is a trusted system where people have learned in the last 10 years to transfer or to tend to store value. Now, how much value they can store measured in fiat currency is obviously a search a price discovery process. At one point, it's $200, then it's $20,000. Now it's, I don't know, 8,000 something. Um, so it, it, we, we don't know yet how much worth a Bitcoin actually is because we don't know. But it's a place where you can store value. And so in other words, again, and now back to your question, um, Maybe these cryptocurrencies, not all of them, because not all of them are of high quality, 
But the general idea of cryptocurrencies, of decentralized systems that allow the transfer and store of value or what we consider to be valuable, is an alternative to the current system. So, so, so that means we have another direction of action, another option. Besides the option of changing the regulations, which is hard, as you, as you, I think your question implied, it's really hard to change monetary policy because monetary policy is made by interest groups. Like everything in the world is, is done by, by interest groups. And at the moment, there is no proposal on the table somewhere to democratize the money system. My, we could all vote on certain parameters of the money systems as we vote on politicians every four years. But we don't, and it will take quite some time to come to that point uh, and get a majority for that to, 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 to allow this. But what we can do, or what people are actually doing, is they create parallel structures, be it Bitcoin, be it Ethereum, and everything on top of it, be it decentralized finance. So many things are going on. And uh, I mean, let's see. We just have a new avenue of, of action, a new option to, to, to choose. And if more people start using these things, there may be a shift in the future. Thank you very much. All right. Can I just yeah? one short uh, follow up? Uh, yes, I mean, please. there is no uh, disagreement that it, uh, such kind of token can be money because it can be a medium of exchange, it can be a measurement of value, and it also can be a store of value. But yeah. uh, what I mean more is, um, so for us as a society, we, well, we might argue about that, but we sometimes actually profit from the guidance a central bank can uh, give in certain uh, uh, economic situations. Uh, sometimes we agree, sometimes we disagree. I don't want to get too politically as well, but uh, I, I just say, do we want to lose this ability as a society of a central bank mm -hmm. for the benefit of the decentralized system? I mean, Thank you. also here, yeah, uh, also here, uh, I also don't regard this as this strict dichotomy. We are not discussing <laughs> we are not discussing the status quo stays as it is, as it is, versus everything crashes and then there will cryptocurrency. It's it's not it's not these two extremes are the realistic scenarios to move forward, right? So we will for sure have a mixture. Um, but the interesting thing about the mixture is that one part of that mixture is um, the traditional one controlled by institutions and the other part of the mixture is something that is not controlled by institutions and i like competition so let's see how these two systems actually work on their own but also in 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 relation to each other and let's see what's happening it we, we don't have to overthrow the central banks to get cryptocurrency and also we don't have to um we should not, I think, abolish the whole cryptocurrency uh, um, idea and decentralization idea just because we have central banks and sometimes what they did was useful, which is a discussion in its own, right? Um, because it's, it's related to the design of the money. But I think, Marcus, that what you're saying now, and I want to, uh, in part, I, I really appreciate the, the very nice discussion here. The only thing I want to say is that at the end of the day, what you are just saying now is the whole spirit of your own pre old presentation today is the fact that we have different incentives, we have different models depending which yeah. kind of thing we are addressing at that specific, in that specific exactly. case. It, and this is why the multi incentives are the right way to go in this new future. And I thank you for, for this uh, exactly. very nice insight. Please. And, and, and of course, by implication, it con my presentation contains a slight critique on the, on the current monodimensional um, <laughs> monetary system. Thank you very much. Uh, all right sure let's let's move on um so that was the introductory uh, slide to crypto economics and token engineering and this one is a very nice um way of presenting what a crypto of of let's say the 
the structure of a, of a crypto economic system. This is done by Markel Sagan. Um, uh, you have the link below. So on the left side, it's, it's what he, he, he developed in a, in a generic uh, way. And on the right side in red and, and the colors, it's the mapping to the finance force system. So I'm not going through, through that in detail. I just want to quickly show you the gray part of the, of the figure um, because it helps you to understand maybe uh, uh, DLT systems again in a different way. It's, it's also something like a stack, but it's uh, not a technology stack. So, but let's start at the bottom for once. It says durable data, trustworthy state information. This is another way of describing a DLT system, right? This is exactly what it does. It does not more than that, but also not less. The blockchain is a place we can all agree uh, this is a state of, of, of information. We all trust it and, and, and it doesn't depend on a, on a third party or an intermediary or a central institution or anything like this. This is what makes everything on top possible and, 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 and worthy to think about. The next level, trusted computation. Cryptographically guaranteed execution of code. This was the innovative idea of Vitalik Buterin and Ethereum. That the records in the distributed ledger do not have to be numbers like in Bitcoin. They can be pieces of code. And if you persist and distribute these pieces of code, you have what they call a world computer or you have an unstoppable piece of software because it's running outside, it's massively uh, uh, replicated on many machines and you basically cannot stop it. And others can use your piece of software with all the trust guarantees you have on the, on the lower uh, level as well. So these two levels allow you to create uh, or to facilitate interaction patterns, uh, local mechanisms, local incentives that, that in a way, put constraints. So, uh, as you will see later on, um, you, can, you can allow people to do certain things with the tokens, like transfer them or burn them, or you're not allowing these things. And according to these constraints, um, certain interactions, certain patterns of, of how people use the tokens or interactions will, uh, will be enabled or, or prevented. So these patterns then, um, uh, micro patterns, then allow certain behavior for the agents in every like, lo lo locality, let's say, in the network. So they are the product of all these mechanisms, incentives, and the context. So you will have tree tokens acting in a certain context and allowing different interaction patterns because they are designed differently to a reputation token, to take a different example for once that is not monetary related, but you could have reputation and maybe more than one dimension of, of, of reputation. Um, also, you could, for example, have the idea that there are tokens that you get by the system that you cannot spend yourself, but you can transfer them to others which is an interesting concept and we have nothing today that is equivalent to that um, and so what what so, so that's an interesting mixture between an altruistic act and and some something you have your own individual interests and motives to do so so what could we do alone with that simple primitive uh, interaction pattern, I have a token, but I cannot spend it. I can only give it to somebody else and they can do something with it. And of course, the other person can do the same to me. So in all of these, the accumulation, the aggregation of all these local behaviors will on the macro level, um, hopefully achieve goals we set in the beginning. Because as you can imagine, and also as the picture uh, shows, it goes up and downwards. When designing a crypto economic system, you have to work on all five uh, uh, levels um, and make sure the interactions, actually the ones you want to have are enabled. And therefore it's so complicated. It's not just writing the piece of software and then hoping most of the people will act the same way you think they will act because people will act in 
very different ways. They will try to break the system. They will try to misuse the system to use it in a very different way. You have maybe not intended and, and, and not even thought about, etc., etc. And therefore, which I also have a slide about, um, simulation and modeling of these systems is so important. Okay, let's move on. The thing to do when you don't know, because as you have seen, it's very complex, is not to bluff and not to freeze, but to learn. The way to learn is by experiment, or as Buckminster Fuller put it, by trial and error, error, error. That was said by uh, quite a famous person, Donald Meadows, in a nice book, which I recommend to have a look, which is called Thinking in Systems. So in other words, how do we go about designing such systems and test them and try out and, and check whether it's actually working or not. I think there are more or less three, three ways to do this. On the, on the left side, you see a screenshot of, of our app. Um, yeah, it's sort of still a current version of, of the app, but uh, you will see the original in a minute. Um, design science, which means the development of our technical artifact, this fin for Finance 4 Explorer piece of software, and how users interact with it, and what we think should be there from a, from a conceptual point of view, is an interwoven, iterative process. The middle uh, is called simulation. So, and that's a challenging part as well, um, because you, you cannot basically rely, if, if I create a new version of a word processor software, that is not Word, but let's call it LibreOffice, and I distribute it to everyone, and this piece of software basically has everything you would expect from a, from a word processor piece of software, so you can write text, you can format it, and do layouts, and have colors, and chapters, and all these things. Um, the potential for, for like misuse is not so great, right? You can at the end write texts with it. Here in that system, or in any other DLT system with some parameters that can vary, a lot of things can happen. So in our case, people are anonymous. All of them can obtain positive action tokens. Do we want that? Is that actually, is there something we need to prevent here? Anyone can create positive action tokens. And later on, it's just a matter of time, in a way, anyone can vote on positive action tokens. So what do we have to think about going through these stages in terms of, going back quickly, in terms of these interaction patterns? Because we do not want to unduly restrict the behavior of people on the platform, obviously. Maximizing freedom of, of action is, is uh, is one of the goals, but at the same time, they should not be able to crash the system. But what does crashing the system actually mean? You can only find out if you simulate because you cannot create a software, then unleash it to 100,000 people and see what happens. But what you can do, you can do experiments and you should do experiments to validate the simulation and also to validate your, your design in the first place. So we have a few organizations we work with, um, um, that are willing to try these new uh, things out. So Wertfrei and the Haus der Statistik are two communities that are interested to try in their small communities to try um, out such a multi-token um, system. And then we have other projects with WWF and, and Climate Kick, which I, which I can mention later. This I can do rather quickly uh, because the screenshots are, are different today because it's uh, not completely new here. Um, but just to give you an idea, this is a process of creating a token. There are all kinds of parameters, where's my mouse? All kinds of parameters you can think about. Um, and Ben will show you this much more in detail in a minute. Another piece of the software um, is related to governance. Um, and I also want to show it just quickly to you in terms of a building block of such an interaction pattern. That thing is called a token curated registry. Now, before diving into that, that figure, which is not so important at the moment, 
Um, I mentioned in the beginning, when everybody can create tokens and you have hundreds of tokens in the system, how do you know, how can you distinguish the good ones from the bad ones, the robust, well-designed ones from the other ones? And I said, well, uh, we, we implemented a, a mechanism that users can collectively vote good tokens into a list. And this here is a generic picture of such a list. It's a registry, a curated registry. Curated means a group of people decided what goes in and what is out. And it's based on a token. In our case, in FIN4, that would be the governance token I mentioned earlier. And um, having this governance token allows you to participate in this process. Two sentences about how the process works. The token creator, somebody who created a new token, comes from the left and proposes this token. It's a token proposal and says, here's a nice token, a tree token. I define it this way, that way, blah, blah. And I stay, it's like a mixture. So the whole token curated registry thing is basically a mixture between poker and voting. So I put 300 governance tokens for the sake of the example on the table and say, uh, here are my 300 uh, governance tokens. Here's my proposal for the tree token. Please have a look. And then the voting and discussion process starts. And it, during that process, during that, let's say, two week time period, for example, somebody can challenge the proposal and they have to stake 300 governance tokens as well. Because guess what? The loser will lose their tokens. You have to have skin in the game, else it doesn't matter to you how many tokens make it to the list or not, right? So this is an incentive scheme that incentivizes the participants to first of all, create a high quality list together. And the way of doing this is by staking, by, by like in poker, by staking a certain amount of governance tokens that you had to work for quite hard in the past and you do not want to lose them because they allow you to participate in these things, right? So you would like to win. And then some decision is, is made. I, I mean, if it's challenged, then everybody who is uh, eligible uh, to be participating in governance can participate. And then there's some voting and the decision is the token is in noise out. Yeah. And the losing party loses their 300 uh, governance tokens and they're distributed on the, uh, uh, on the winning side uh, between the people who either challenged or proposed and the ones who voted on the, on the, on the right side. There's a whole uh, uh, strand of, unfortunately not yet really academic, but, but still literature out, out there. Uh, if you search for token curated registry, TCR, there's, a much, there's much stuff to, to read about. So let's, let's, stop at, uh, let's stop this here. The simulation approach, I'm not going into details, I just mentioned it earlier already. Um, at each stage, because they are anonymous, Anyone can do anything on the, on the, on the, in the system at some point in time. You have to think about it and how can we, how can we by design, prevent certain mishaps. Uh, you will receive all these slides anyhow, so, so don't worry, I'm not going into the details. Um, modeling the design space. This is a snapshot of work in progress. Um, which I think is quite nicely capturing uh, one of the design challenges in the space. So the three dimensions of the cube you can see are, uh, let's start on the Z axis, creator intent. So is the creator of the token well intended, uh, well intentioned, well intended, I don't know, of good intention or of bad intention. Um, the same is the light blue on the side of the user of such a token. Um, because you as a user could realize, hey, this token is, has a flaw in its design and it's very easy to get it. I won't tell anyone, I just make myself rich for whatever reason, uh, <clears throat> because I understand how to easy, <coughs> sorry, how to easily get this token. And then it only depends on, on your feeling of compliance towards the system and its goals. <clears throat> And of course, the third, third aspect is 
the design of the token itself. Because even a, a bad intended creator can end up with a well-designed token or the other way around. <coughs> so, and what we are trying to do is, I, sorry. <clears throat> <clears throat> and what <clears throat> what we're trying to do is to move as much activity as possible to the ideal space which you can see in the cube um, it's basically the edge pointing towards you where you can see the word ideal written because ideally the tokens are well designed and basically everybody in the system has, has good intentions. And if people uh, um, uh, behave differently, like, like humans, in other sub, uh, sectors of the cube, um, we have to think about how to create the, in the overall design of incentives that most of the activity moves to the ideal space. And finally, the experiments. <clears throat> and I have only two, three more slides and then I'm through. Um, so here I want to show you, uh, although it's in German, here are a few of the first ideas of this community called Wertfrei, uh, a Swiss <coughs> community that does reintegration work of unemployed people. So they, they had different ideas and, and um, we still are in discussions how the tokens will then be designed. But so Grundeinkommen means basic income. Uh, project token, I think you understand. Um, um, so this means working in the gardens, working in the in the multi generation flat share uh, flat shares, and here's uh, some some donation projects. So so they really think about different <clears throat> different areas of action their members can engage in, and how could tokens represent these different actions. And, and the table basically shows you um, the different um, project partners or organizations we're in contact with and what kind of, um, because yeah, at the end, they all have different interests and, 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 and have their own issues and contexts and, and so they have their own token designs and that's exactly how it should be. So final word, and it's not mine, it's by Matsukato. Um, she wrote a book, The Value of Everything, recommended read. So instead of considering markets as this efficiency machine that basically creates more profit, see, she suggests to, to consider markets as outcomes. That means today we are able, and she's not even talking about blockchain at all. It's, it's a, it's a, she's an economist and it's an... Uh, let's say maybe a progressive economist, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> she says, we can use market mechanisms to further the goals of our societies and we should do that. And the second um, quote I give here, the, the emphasis on mine, but anyway, favoring, so we can favor long-term investment over short-term. We can fund new financial institutions and she gives an example of mission-oriented state investment banks. She's not, yeah, she's still thinking in centralized uh, solutions, but that's fine. And um, it's about strategic long-term finance um, because we need, we need exploration and research um, of these new underlying value creation mechanisms. And of course, our contribution here is to add this decentralized element, right? Um, so everything which I wrote down in red is also what she's uh, arguing for. And, and I extend, or I, I, on top of that argument, say decentralized, participatory, multidimensional, democratically governed incentive systems are an interesting avenue to choose and to do experiments and to try out to achieve the goal she's mentioning above. Um, de-risking investments and, and uh, um, exploring new sources and, and, and new notions of value. And with that, I thank everyone for listening and the engaged discussion, and that's it. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Marcus, for this very interesting talk and provocative as well as few points. So, are there questions? I will have some discussions before, but I would be more happy. But you want to make up your questions as well, guys. I have uh, maybe a question, uh, a quick one, I hope, on unpaid labor. There is a problem now in society that certain, uh, shall I say, areas of labor are not really paid for. I mean, uh, an obvious example is housewives. Yep. They're not usually paid for their labor. Could it, be that, uh, could it be that a tokenized economy sort of removes that kind of, kind of inequality in terms of Ep being paid, actually, for your labor? What is your so I'm not sure about if... Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm, I'm done, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I mean, how effective that will be, we will see. But, but that's exactly <clears throat> one, of the, one of the levers of change we can provoke that, is not exist, that does not exist today. Um, why, why it's unpaid labor? Because it's not valued in today's system. You cannot, uh, it would be arbitrary to say, nursing the child three hours a day is, how much is it? Is it minimum wage? Should I give it 850 euros per hour? Or should I, is it more? Is it more like service in a restaurant? Or is it even more? Is it, is it, who knows? And we would discuss, is it more one more euro or less or blah, blah, blah. But we all agree it's valuable work. And maybe we can escape this whole narrow discussion, which at the end is just about the figure of some, some mental concept. The euro only exists in our minds, right? It's nothing real. It's just Harari in his book, Sapiens, calls these things collective imaginations. Nation states and monetary systems are collective imaginations. There's no physical thing. We decided it should be this way. So we can also change this design. And absolutely, why not take unpaid labor and, and start giving it at least a placeholder, a token, which is the word token means placeholder, to, 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 to show uh, this person did this or does this regularly. And here, this is the, the balance of tokens they, they receive from us from now on to show this. Whether this will be translatable into a fiat currency is, of, is a secondary question. Because we could go without the fiat currency. Because as soon as the community agrees that, that this unpaid labor is actually still valuable labor, these tokens have value. And that can be done with all kinds of things. Very good. Thank you very much. Yeah.